And now it's time for everyone to meet my dear friend and colleague, Mike. Dr. Michael S. French is an ethical culture leader and an affiliate minister at Baltimore's First Unitarian Church. Trained as an historian, Mike served as leader of the Baltimore Ethical Society before working in health policy and planning for the Maryland Department of Health. He now calls himself a retired old guy. He plays the concertina, loves English country and contra dancing, and urban bicycling. He is a board member of the Baltimore City Historical Society and the Green Burial Association of Maryland. He's an active member of the National Leaders Council of the American Ethical Union, and it is delightful to see you, Mike. I look forward to the time when we can meet in person again, but this will have to do. Take it away, Mike. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Anne. And let me just say at the onset, it was so great to hear that Charlie King song uh, a few minutes ago. I have uh, a T-shirt that says that on the front and back. You know, my life is more than my work. My work is more than my job. So thank you very much for that. That's just a great song. And okay, I say, hey, my, I'm Mike French. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm wearing a dark shirt with a checkered pattern, a black vest, and uh, I'm great. So, so glad to be here with you. <clears throat> Start by talking about, I heard a profound theological or philosophic debate uh, while sitting on the floor of a Sunday school classroom. Uh, I think even a more profound debate than I've sometimes heard at our leaders' councils meetings. It encapsulates the heart and the dilemma of our religion. The debaters were all of about six or seven years old or, or thereabouts. They're elementary school teachers, uh, students. We must have been discussing the concept of worth. Now, Nadine didn't buy that everybody had inherent worth and dignity. Gabe argued strenuously that everybody did. Finally, Nadine capitulated, sort of. And these are her words that everybody had worth, she conceded, but some people use it up. Well, this happened, happened to happen in a UU Sunday school, but it just as well could have happened in an ethical culture Sunday school. Both denominations place a high value on the worth and dignity of the person. <clears throat> and I'm going to explore the concept of worth in three ways this morning. What's with worth? Why is the concept of worth of every individual, why I think we just made up, so important? Second, perceiving the person before you. Why we focus on the individual, even as we focus on community. And three, rules. There are rules to help us behave in a way that shows that we really do believe in the worth and dignity of the individual. So what's with worth? Proceeding the person before you and rules. So first, why the concept of worth and dignity of every individual is so important. Individual worth and dignity is not a concept unique to us. Other denominations and religions also stress it. It deals with human behavior, not the relationship to a deity, but is no less a statement of faith. And its implications are profound. Maybe talking about worth and dignity is a way for people who aren't theists to talk about why we should treat people in a certain way. Maybe saying everyone is a person of worth is a way for non-theists to express what Quakers call that of God in everyone. You can think of the, world, the word as a replacement for a mystical concept, or maybe it's a mystical concept itself. Proclaiming the worth and dignity of every individual is a radical position. In fact, let's do a thought experiment. Think of the person or persons you despise the most. You know, I'm sure you can think of people who do not exhibit worth and dignity. I'm sure we're probably maybe thinking of the same persons or person. Uh, that 
that person has worth and dignity. And by inference, you must treat that person as a person of worth and dignity. And how you treat that person says something about you and your adherence to our proclaimed belief, which are beliefs, which are about behavior. So, you know, think of someone, take a moment here, you know, you despise this person, but you got to acknowledge that they have worth and dignity and you got to treat them as that. Think for a moment. Hard, isn't it? And people think we have an easy religion. Well, why attribute worth to everyone? I have concluded it's because we humans need to come up with intellectual justifications for the emotions we feel. This is another chapter in humanity's struggle to come up with reasons to treat each other decently. We need to justify empathy by taking that by making such actions a command from a deity or at least justified by philosophic principle. You know, the quote from Arthur Dobrin, he just he tells, tells us we need to feel empathy. Uh, you know, just a good thing. But historically, there's, you know, we got to justify this. For example, in the Hebrew Bible, you find these instructions. When you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You must not strip your vineyard bare or gather its fallen grapes. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Now, this is saying you have to care about people. You must care about the poor and the stranger. I suspect that the people who wrote this commandment were empathetic, or at least sympathetic people, and they wanted to provide guidance to those who were like-minded and to direct the behavior of those who were not at all sympathetic or empathetic. They believed in a deity, and that's the authority they turned to. They didn't try to persuade you that these people had worth. It's a commandment of God. Those who don't believe in a God or gods can't just say God says behave in a certain way. I believe that the concept of human worth is one of the great human inventions. We impute something special, which we call worth and dignity, to everyone, which implies that we must treat everyone as a person of worth and dignity. Now, I don't believe that worth is inherent in the same way that, say, DNA is inherent. Worth is something we put there. We attribute it to others and to ourselves. And in this, I am much influenced. In fact, I can say I think I'm entirely influenced by Felix Adler, the founder of ethical culture. Adler based much of his ethical philosophy of life on the concept of worth, which he distinguished from value. You know, value being the use, usefulness of persons, of people. Some people are very valuable in what they do. Other people may seem less valuable, but they all have worth. He asked, and I'm quoting him here, by what warrant do I ascribe worth to any human being? My answer is that certainly I do not discover the quality of worth in people as an empirical fact. In many people, I do not even discover value. The answer to the objection is that I do not find worth in others or in myself. I attribute it to them and to myself. And why do I attribute it? In virtue of the reality producing functions of my own mind. Now, reality producing functions of my own mind is an odd phrase for us to use today. It basically means by thinking it up and saying it's there, and more importantly, acting on the concept, worth becomes real. We act as though worth exists. We treat people as persons of worth and dignity, and the idea becomes manifest. And, you know, some people more philosophically adept than I am, such as our colleague, Dr. Joseph Schumann, would go in more into the idealistic concept of uh, thinking that, that Adler was using. I'm stretching it a little bit here, but if you want proof of the fact that we create value with our minds, open your wallet 
and take out a piece of paper that we call currency. We believe it has value. Other people do too. And so it has value. So I think you will find that the commitment to the inherent worth and dignity of every person can work for you, can inspire you, can guide you, and very frequently confound you as to what you should do. I'll get to a rule to help you in a few minutes. But first, let's consider the every person part of the inherent worth and dignity of every person. So let's think about this perceiving the person before you. We're very focused on groups these days, but this morning I'm focusing on individuals, the person part of the title of this talk. In our everyday life, we make judgments about people. We make quick assessments. Studies show that people decide about other people within seconds. People can look at me and think, old white guy. This is a true description. And from that description, you can infer some things about my life experience. I always feel like myself, but I can be perceived much differently depending on circumstance and how I present myself. Sometimes in my Unitarian Universalist setting, I have the august dignity of being the Reverend Dr. Michael French. And I'm, I'm wearing a suit or even on some very special occasions, a robe with three broad imitation velvet stripes on the sleeves. And I suppose the stripes are vanity on my part. Basically, uh, you know, I feel that if I'm going, you know, if we have processionals, which ethical culture doesn't, but you used to. Uh, and basically, I feel that if I'm going to march in with the penguins, I should dress like a penguin. You know, I'm treated very well on these occasions. And I'm an important person but I'm not always such a good dresser. Here's a once upon a time story. My late wife was a lawyer at Maryland Legal Aid, which does civil cases for poor people. I know New York Legal Aid does criminal cases. Maryland only does civil. Uh, well, late one afternoon, I came to pick her up. The new person at the reception desk as I walked in, looked at me and announced, intake is closed for the day. I guess I wasn't dressed so well. I probably looked like I wandered down the street from healthcare for the homeless. The other staffer at the desk corrected the first one. That's okay, he's not a client. He's Eileen French's husband. Probably thinking, poor Eileen. When I told Eileen about this, she told me to dress better. So apparently one of my identities is Mike French, bum. But that got me to thinking. Maybe on some Reverend Dr. French occasions, I should show up dressed as Mike French bum. Maybe that would be a better way to preach the worth and dignity of every human being. Now, I don't fault the legal aid receptionist. As I said, we make quick judgments of, about people based on survival techniques evolution has built into us. But there are also socially inculcated ways of looking at people. If you're in any group considered a minority in American culture, you know this. I'm aware that even in my Mike French bum outfit, I carry at least some remnant of my white privilege. I don't always have to wear a suit and tie to expect at least some measure of respect from society. But while we are programmed to see people as belonging to a category, our religion calls us to see each person as a person. Our task as worth seeing individuals is to see the person before us as a unique, valuable, irreplaceable individual, not simply as a, mem a member of a group. To perceive the person as a unique individual with unique experiences and whose life will be influenced by membership in a category, but who are more than that category. The point I'm trying to make here is that we have many identities, some of which give us higher status in society, some of which give us lower status. It is inevitable that we will 
least initially make judgments based on a quick appraisal of externals. But our religion asks us to look beyond this appraisal, to see the person of worth and dignity, and to treat that person as a person of worth and dignity. To be clear, we all fall into categories, and it's important to recognize these categories. As we attempt to build diverse pluralistic congregations, it is important to see these categories. But a person is not a category. We want to be perceived as the person we are, not as a representative of our race, our gender, our sexuality, or whatever. In fact, let's take another minute to do another thought experiment. Think of all the categories you fall into, the various ways society might look at you. Then, what is your most important descriptor? What do you think of yourself? What do you, what might you say in introducing yourself to a stranger? Here's an example someone might say. I, I base this after a person I know. I'm young, I'm African American, I'm gay, but my primary identity as a student of 17th century European music. Think of me as a musicologist. Now, clearly you do not do a deep dive into the lives of everyone you meet. Our task is not to pry into people's lives. After all, some of them, like Emily Dickinson, live private lives because they want to live private lives. There was a fellow in my congregation whom I'll call William Smith because Smith wasn't his name. I once asked him, do you prefer to be called William or Bill? He responded, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, he was to me. Our task is to pay attention to the person before us in a way appropriate to situation and circumstance. Here I'm helped by the insights of the Protestant theologian Harvey Cox and his 1965 book, The Secular City. Cox contrasts the intimate relationship of his small town upbringing with his big city life. He knew everyone in his small town, the mail carrier, the fuel oil person, but in the big city, he dealt with a lot of anonymous people. His relationship with these people was not the same, except for the requirement that he treat everyone as a human being, which I define as treat them with respect. So let's look at this treat them with respect thing. Yeah. You know, my job is not just to harangue you or even to inspire you, but also give you tools. So let's think about circumstances and let's think about rules because this is not just about principle to believe, but behaviors to exhibit. Here, I take the advice of Susan Stebbing, an important early 20th century British philosopher. She gave herself and us some advice in a little book published in 1941. In 1941, Britain's getting the hell bombed out of it. And she comes out with this little book and she writes, my advice to myself as well as to others is be definite. To formulate one's ideals is not to set out a string of maxims. It is to answer questions in the form, what is worth having? What is worth having in such and such specifiable circumstance? Who is to be the subject of these questions? Morality concerns actions. My actions, your actions, their actions. And it starts from my actions. Close quote. Let me repeat that last sentence. Morality concerns action. My actions, your actions, their actions, and it starts from my actions. You know, ethical culture from the beginning was about belief, but more about belief was about behavior. You know, how do we behave in this crazy mixed up world we live in? So let's get specific. It's one thing to say, everyone has worth and dignity, and another to say, we must treat every person as a person of worth and dignity. Emphasis on treat there. How do we treat these people? How do we go about this and do, do so in different circumstances? 
everything I've said this morning so far leads to this. First, what does it mean to treat everyone as a person of worth and dignity? The word I keep coming back to is respect. Treat everyone, everyone with respect. I find it more a more useful concept, by the way, than love. Respect is my go-to word for how I should behave. It applies to situations and circumstances that are as varied as the persons you have before you. I know that this will come easier for some of us than others. Some of us are short of patience. Some of us are quick to form judgments. Some of us get angry easily. It will, it will be more work for some of us than for others. And to add to the challenge, I'm talking about baseline behavior here, not heroics. Treating everyone with respect, treating everyone as a person in dignity doesn't get you sainthood. That should be ordinary, everyday behavior. This is a minimum, folks. It gets you a C, not an A. If it makes it easier, I'm not asking you to get all buddy-buddy with everyone you meet. Just treat them with respect. And how do you do that? And how you do this will vary from situation to situation, from relationship to relationship. A smile and a wave at a squeegee worker might be sufficient. I know you have, you have those in Brooklyn. I bet you do. We have them in Baltimore. You know these kids at street corners with their spray bottles and their, their squeegees to clean your windshield. You know sometimes they've got money, sometimes they don't. A smile and a wave at a squeegee worker might be sufficient. A long chat with a fellow society member during after meeting coffee might be appropriate and necessary. There are many varieties and levels of respectful behavior. And since respect is complex, it's helpful to have rules. You don't have to believe in the worth and dignity of each individual in order to treat them with respect. We need pathways to ethical living. A rule won't tell us specifically what to do. We will still require discernment for specific instances, but we have some idea of how to behave. So rules, humankind has a history of these rules. One of the most important and simplest is the so-called golden rule. You'll, sign it, you'll find it in versions attributed to Confucius, Rabbis Hillel and Akiva, and Jesus, it takes two basic form. There's the negative form. Don't do unto others what you don't want done unto you. And it's positive form. Do unto others as you would be done unto you. The do unto others form is considered more ethically advanced because it urges behavior. You must do something. You know, just don't do, but now do. Okay, so far, so good. A good, simple rule. You don't have to be a theologian or a philosopher to study or live by it. But the golden rule doesn't offer much, offer, offer much guidance for behavior and has a big deficiency. When you come right down to it, it's all about yourself. What you don't like, what you do like. This deficiency bothered Felix Adler. Adler's version of the golden rule, he called it a supreme ethical rule, is this, act so as to elicit the best in others and thereby in yourself. I'll repeat that. Act so as to elicit the best in others and thereby in yourself. I think this is one of the great gifts of ethical culture. These, these few words, these great gifts of ethical culture to our civilization. This differs from the traditional version and that you begin not by considering what you like or don't like, but from your consideration of the other. What is the best for the other? You have to be open to the other. You have to pay attention to the other. I don't know often what is the best, what the best course of action is. I often don't know what will bring out the best in the other. But I know the ways I can behave that will bring out the worst in me and the worst in both of us. And I can avoid that. You know, someone mentioned the memory of, of, of Susan Rose uh, in our joys and remembering session. 
I quoted her in, in one uh, ethical address when she was in the audience, it was up in West, Westchester County. And she wrote an essay in the Ethical Culture Without Walls newsletter about she was having difficulty with a conduct, with a, with a colleague, and she didn't know what she should do. But she knew that if she tried to think of the way to bring out the best in the others, she would at least bring out the best in herself. I have taken Adler's act so as to elicit the best in others and thereby in yourself as my guide, guide for years, decades in fact, and I can tell you that it works. I will not always do the right thing, but I think it helps me to not do the wrong things. And, and, and I, I know that I'll always be acting with respect. Well, I might know what not know what definite action to take in a specific circumstance. I do know, as Susan Stebbing wrote 80 some years ago, that morality starts with my actions. I want to be respected. I want to be respectful of others. I want a respectful world. So all this starts from my actions. Let's conclude by going back to that profound discussion by six and seven year olds that I started with. Do I really have worth? Does something called worth really existed, really exist? Did people who needed a God substitute simply invent it? It doesn't really matter as long as we believe that our behavior counts and that we should act on the assumption that our behavior counts. It's the behavior that counts. Follow the rule. Treat everyone with respect. And that way, you become a person worthy of respect yourself and a person who is helping to create a better world. A world in which everybody's worth and dignity is respected, even if they seem to have used it up. Thank you.